Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. We truly enjoy seeing the same faces every night, day in and day out. It really is the, the highlight of our day. How's your yeah, we uh, do. day? This is awesome. How's your day going, brother? It's good. Uh, uh, it's actually just catching up on some stuff. Uh, the weather was really weird. It, uh, it was threatening to snow earlier of all. <laughs> It's threatening to snow. It's threatening yeah. to snow there, and it's pollen is dropping here. Yeah, well, it's not threatening anymore right now. Now it's just overcast and like 70 degrees out. So I don't know what's going on with the weather. Something yeah. is definitely weird. Like anybody who doesn't believe that things are changing, just look out your window. It is. I don't know, but... if, it's like, I don't know if it's like that all over. Um, I know that like over in your neck of the woods and like up in the, you know, the center of the United States, just seeing where those, uh, the CMEs are hitting and the weather is just like, I mean, like, I don't know what it means, oh, but that you know reminds me like, yeah, Ben has been, he's been doing videos, like showing like the severe weather all up the, uh, the center of the United States. Well, it, it, you spark something that I mentioned, I, uh, was going to mention, but I'd forgot about it. He, um, put out a warning the other day saying that the Southeast United States is going to deal with um, solar storms. Yep. And I, I was like, whatever. Our TVs at the club were glitching for the last two days. My dually batteries went completely dead and had to replace my dually batteries. A friend of mine Weird. went out to his car on the way leaving from work, a brand new Honda and it wouldn't start. Hmm. Um, I can just go down the list of electrical stuff that was acting like it had a mind of its own. I've never, in, in our club, there's a hundred TVs, meaning they're all yeah. on walls because we use them for advertisements and they were glitching sure. and it was, uh, it was uh, something else. And I was like, weird. geez, huh. yeah, super weird. Yeah. We, um, let's see, I think we were traveling at that, at the, no, wasn't it the, uh, well, didn't it hit the same day that that boat hit the bridge in Baltimore? Because weren't because I know that I was listening to them say that it could knock out GPS. Yeah, they speaking of which they found the they pulled the black box from it and it's got um, three minutes of missing data. Of course it does. <laughs> just like um, just like certain jail cells when their cameras go down and there's missing data. <laughs> uh, actually, pattern. Uh, Timothy Thrapp's assistant sent me a long winded in Intel report on that. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. I and saw that. holy moly. Um, yeah. This, in my humble opinion, is not an accident. And the same morning, another bridge in Ohio was hit and burned. And that the correlation is the bridge in Baltimore is representative of the gentleman that wrote the star spangled banner and right. the bridge in Ohio is, uh, based off independence. Hmm. So interesting. It's, it's very interesting. And what's even yeah. more interesting is the, the bridge in Baltimore in the civil war time period, there was something, uh, bridging that area as well, because it was essentially the Mason-Dixon line right there. And in Civil War, they blew that bridge right before the uh, war started to sever supplies. Yeah, yeah so, it's definitely a suspicious situation because had that boat not dropped its anchor, it would have just smoothed sailed right underneath the bridge. But something dropped that anchor at just the right time that caused it to turn. So that was suspicious. Well, well, it, not even that. There were supposed to be tugboats guiding the boat out of the harbor, and they weren't doing that. The the harbor chief was fired the day before, and the new one was brought in the day of. There's that reminds that reminds me of a story uh, I heard about Boeing with uh, all these all these parts falling off the planes at Boeing because they've been systematically getting rid of their educated employee employment workforce and replacing them with low cost migrants, uh, you know, like, 
my, well, not even migrants, but like, you know, the, the 737, the reason why they have to keep grounding that thing is because the, the engineers who are programming the software for it have no aerospace uh, experience that they literally just hired some cheap programmers from, you know, a, a foreign country. And um, it, it's not flying the planes right. So they have to keep landing them. And then also those who are doing the maintenance on the planes make less. Some of them make less than nine bucks an hour. I don't know how that's possible considering the, it's not even minimum wage, but uh, that's what was reported. Sounds like a solid business plan, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe stay away from airplanes for a while. <laughs> oh man, I, I can't keep up with the shenanigans anymore. It's it's so much that you know, folks that follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our social platform, I'm constantly posting stuff. Usually, I used to have to dig to find stuff, but I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm yeah. only posting. I'm only posting really the. I'm ignoring two thirds of it because. There, there's too much so yeah. um it's uh, it's extremely interesting um i watched something very interesting on the uh it, it was a documentary about the progress of the ai and yeah. nvidia's chips um the the lead programmer the lead company that makes these chips for ai processing is uh nvidia Right. And they have this new chip that is something else. It <laughs> it's um, uh, literally uh, thirteen million times faster than the current chip oh, that yeah. they're using. Like yeah. not just a thousand x, not two thousand x. It went from like uh, one teraflop power to sixteen teraflops or something. Something just out of this world that they're going to use as the, the fundamental brain for their new robots. Yeah. I have a very low opinion of NVIDIA and their presentations. Cause I've seen those presentations year after year where they, they literally make the same claim every year. How, you know, this year's new chip is, you know, a billion times better than last year's new chip. And it's got, you know, 16 billion, whatever transistors on it. And then it just turns out to be a big fat, nothing burger. Um, I remember when they, uh, when Tesla was using the, um, I can't remember which chip it was, but it had like trillions of transistors on it and it was supposed to yeah. be the most super intelligent chip. And like, it turned out to be the most hackable chip and any of the Tesla cars that have that chip have a, like a, a hardware flaw where you can hack them. So like Elon, like nicks that and, uh, those same Tesla's. Uh, all have like super laggy screens and stuff like that. So I have a hmm. very low opinion of NVIDIA when it comes to that kind of thing. But I did see that. I, I saw the presentation that you're referring to, those new something like processors. I, I wonder if they are not spending enough time to refine these things and they keep moving on to something better instead of refining what they have. Seems like it because it's in a constant competition. I mean, Elon got so sick and tired of it, he just started designing his own chips. And that's what they're using for their full self-driving now, which he has uh, made the statement that this week, uh, is it this week? I think it's this week they're actually doing a big push for full self-driving because they have their, their latest hands-free. So they switched their code base from handwritten code to AI code because it's significantly better. Like it can handle hands-free driving from your drive from door to door now. And the, and people who have used it say it's a lot like uh, a human driver to where it's much more aggressive at making turns and going into traffic and driving like an actual person would drive. So My that will be interesting to see, you know, they're pushing that out to the, to the mass market either this week or next week. It's very soon though. Yeah, that stuff all concerns me. The the intelligence that they're providing these things for full autonomy um, yeah. at some point is going to turn into Skynet. Um, <laughs> I'm not yeah, well, Elon's either. one of the most outspoken um, people when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, and one of the reasons why he invested in open AI so, is so that they could get a control of it before 
because he's been outspoken about it being more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Um, that well, artificial gen general intelligence has has the potential to be more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Um, well, the autonomy. It's, it's of, yeah, it's one Go of ahead. his missions in life to literally combat it. That's that's part of his reasoning behind Neuralink is in the event that AGI is unleashed, we don't have interfaces that we can operate on fast enough in order to control and combat AGI. Whether he's truthful about that or, or not, but that's what he says when he talks about Neuralink and, and part of his motivation is because he's afraid of AI. Wow. And, and he does make a distinction between, you know, AI and AGI. Um, you know, they use AI What's the in difference? their self drive. Oh, yeah. Uh, AGI is more like a person. Yeah, AGI is more like something that can think and act for on its own, where AI is more like what you use to generate images. Okay, like artificial general intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Where, yeah, it's the AGI uh, that's, that scares him because it has the ability to make decisions without emotions. So, like, you know, it, it, it could potentially be the thing that determines that, you know, humans are a virus and take action to exterminate them. Well, yeah, it's something that becomes self-aware and identifies right. something as a threat to their um, existence. And yeah. I'm, it, see, that's what gets me. You know, you would think the folks that are running the show when it comes to that technology would know that when something gets smart enough, it's going to become self-aware and reassess its environment yeah. and identifying... He's Go ahead. He's currently suing OpenAI, the you know the the ones who are who make ChatGPT, because they are not adhering to the original terms of his investment. They're they're turning into a for profit business and they're pursuing AGI, which he explicitly invested in the company to com combat that uh, those actions. It's just interesting to see all of these Hollywood movies over the years literally coming to fruition. Yeah, um, uh, those Terminator movies seemed so far fetched back in the day, and as good as they were, now mm -hmm. they don't seem as far fetched as they once did. Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting, and it's it. If you guys haven't seen the original Terminators in a long time, I would encourage you guys to watch them and let and let your brain digest that storyline again it will really uh open your eyes because everybody remembers the just the general outline and how it goes down i hadn't watched it in shoot i can't tell you when it, it's been so long it's been decades i re-watched them recently and the storyline it was just it was just incredible it's it made too much sense to the point where i was like Holy moly, that is, um, that's concerning. Yeah. So, <sighs> do you have an image on your screen? Oh, yeah, yeah, I thought we had a guest. I was like, hey. No, no, yeah, that's just my sharing uh, for Kip. That's her slideshow when Kip comes Oh, up. cool, yeah. So, um, what else was I going to mention? Man, there's so much stuff going on that I've uh, I lost track of. So, this thing with Puff Daddy, it's oh, yeah. tied. It's tied into the royal family, and I think yeah, that that's the. I think that's the reason Kip, uh, not Kip, Kate, um, is not around. I think yeah. that something. Now I'm just speculating, but she hasn't resurfaced, and it's awfully coincidental that. Within a few months of her not being around, now there is information being spilt on the royal family and all its ties to sacrifices and trafficking mm. and Satanism. And it's just, um, it's very interesting. And it makes me yeah. really want to dig in on this. I, I haven't gone and dug in on you know, the deep web in a hot minute. And I think I'm going to do that um, sometime soon. It's just, I don't do it from my house. Um, yeah. Um, so very interesting. Very interesting. All right. 
Uh, we have um, a gentleman coming on in just a minute that's going to chat for 15 minutes that wrote this book, Time is Running Out. This is a good book. Um, it's essentially, I'll let him explain it, but yeah, there he is. Oops. I can't Hello, hear Daniel. you. Can you hear me? Hey. We can hear you. Okay, now I can hear you. All right. Welcome to the show. Oh, we can't hear you, Christopher. No audio. Sorry, I was muted. I was just telling them about your book. It's you literally rang in right when I was um I'm going to let you run with it just because I was just explaining uh, that I like this book. Um, it, curious, why? Uh, well, before we go any further, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, my name is uh, Daniel Ochoa. And, um, you know, first, I'd like to thank both of you, Christopher and Watchful, for having me on the show to talk about my book. It's uh, I felt that God put it on my heart to write this about 15 years ago, and it finally got published. Awesome. Well, why did you write it? Just curious. What was your motivation? Well, when I was in my early 30s, uh, I found myself at church, sitting in church one Sunday morning. And uh, keep in mind, I had been going to church for about six or seven years. Uh, for the past two years prior to that day, uh, hold on, let me shut my door, my dog. <laughs> Sorry about that. For the past uh, two years of that day, Sunday morning, I was attending a men's Bible study. Uh, I was attending Sunday school class and I was sitting in the service and the pastor started talking about where Jesus was talking about the road to heaven and hell and how the road to heaven is very narrow and only a few find it. And yes. I couldn't help but think, what makes you think you're on that narrow road? I mean, it just kept repeating it in my head. You know, why do you think you're on that narrow road? Because you go to church? Because you go yeah. to men's Bible study? And so it haunted me. And so I called the pastor and I asked him if we could uh, meet for lunch. And we met and he kind of explained a lot of things to me. Uh, I did a little bit more digging and, you know, the light bulb went off and I became born again and everything changed i mean from that you know what time before go ahead I, I didn't mean to stop you but what's interesting and it's so awesome to see how god works is i literally before we went live got several messages asking me how do i know that i'm saved and then lo and behold your conversation that's your start point for folks that just asked me this question, this is just an example of uh, his amazing work. It's <laughs> uh, it's not a common question that I get. And I, I literally just got these questions. And then here you are uh, bringing up the topic that I was going to explain later. So it's just it's it's just awesome to see how yeah. it works. You know, you read the book, you'll be convicted, you'll understand what it means to be saved. I mean, in my book, I talk about three verses that are chilling verses that any believer reads should examine themselves, just like Paul suggested that we do. You know, Paul says that we should examine ourselves to see if we're really in the faith. One of them is the road to heaven and hell. Uh, you know, I don't understand how people read that and just continue reading as if, you know, the road was 50-50. And it's not. I mean, if you were to put a percentage on that, where Jesus said it's just a few, we're talking three to ten percent. That's that's a low number. The one other one is, yeah. The other one is the uh, the ten virgins. Has anybody stopped to consider that the five foolish virgins are called virgins, meaning they didn't succumb to the temptation of the Antichrist? They didn't take the mark of the beast. They were waiting for the same Savior as the wise ones. But only to hear, I never knew you. I mean, that th these are church-going people. Half of them are not saved. That's right. Because they're it's because they're lukewarm. Yeah, it's 
if I had to make a guess, and I don't know what you're going to say, you you have uh, many, many, many in the community that attend church every week and give Christ that two hours on Sunday, but they don't have a personal relationship with him where it's a daily interaction, where it's a intimate relationship, just like if you were married and, you know, for example, you know, being married, you wake up, you're talking to your wife, lunchtime, you're talking to your wife, afternoon, evening, you're talking to your wife. That's how my relationship is with Christ. And it's that personal relationship. And I, I feel like that if I had to make an educated guess, the majority of the community, that's not how they operate, but that's what he expects. Right. I mean, if you, you know, talking about marriage, if you think about it, back in, back in biblical times, when a man was going to marry a woman, he would uh, engage, get engaged. Now, the commitment starts at the engagement. Americans think that the commitment starts at the wedding, but it starts at the engagement. As soon as you put a ring, a, uh, an engagement ring on, on a woman, that is a commitment that you're going to spend the rest of your life with her. Then the man in biblical times would go home to his father's house and they would build an extension on the house. And when the, when, the, when the house was ready, the father would tell his son to go get the bride. Think about it. Jesus told us there are many rooms in his father's home, and he's going back to build a room for us. Hmm. And he's going to come back. He is the bride. We're the groom. Okay, what's the role of, a bri of the groom? Or we're the, we're the bride. He's the groom. I'm sorry. But what's the role of a, a groom? It's to love his wife. What's the role of a bride? To be submissive. And that's the problem. Monday through Saturday, a lot of people who go to church aren't submissive. They're not. They're not obeying Jesus. I mean, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. He also said, no one will see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. I mean, Man, it's not he, about he nailed it. Yeah. And it's not about just saying, yeah, I believe because for those six years I was going to church, there was no doubt in my mind. I believed in God. I believe Jesus was the son of God. And I believe he died for my sin. But I was just, just like everybody else, the rest of the world. There was no difference in me come Monday through Saturday. Yeah. The, uh, my role to say is to wake people up because, as you know, we're getting close and people need to wake up and understand what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's, right. so, in it's so interesting that you say this because we had a guest a few nights ago that was an NDE and he was so impacted by his NDE, his experience of going to hell that he created a community called the narrow path and the thumbnail image of his community is a fork in a road. And there's a literally a thousand people going one way and one dude going this way. And he put a, an estimated average of one out of a thousand based off of what he saw. Yeah, whether that's correct or incorrect, that was just his his guesstimate. But if you put well, it out and you and and you really thought about it in the larger context, he may not be far off. No, it's low. I mean, Jesus said only a few. When you think about a few with any number, that's a low percentage. Yeah, he says very few will find it. Yep. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you, your viewers, if you like stories, you're going to love my book. I got a lot of stories to really drive home the point that I'm trying to make. And that's one of the biggest compliments I've get, been getting on my book is they love the stories that are in it. So, you devoted the chapter in your book for the end times. Why do you think that we're near that? Oh, man, there's so many reasons. I mean, you got Israel that has uh, the red heifer. They've been waiting 2,000 years for a red heifer to sacrifice, and they have three of them. And they actually came from Texas. Uh, you got the Jewish council saying that the Messiah is on the ground, and they're going to announce it probably within the next year. Probably this year, they're going to announce who it is. But more than that, you got prophecy. L let me ask you, the, or let me just ask this to your viewers how does god 
inform the last generation, the timing of his coming, but without informing all the generations before them. Because let's be honest, if you and me, if you and I knew that Jesus was coming back definitely for a thousand years, we'd be more relaxed. So Jesus wanted everybody to think that he was could come at any day. But how does he warn the last generation of when he is coming to that group of his timing? And the way he does it, he gives prophecy that no one can interpret until that generation sees it. And that is Israel becoming a nation again. Right. So in my book, when you see the prophecy of Hosea and the prophecy of Ma uh, in Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about the, uh, the fig tree, yeah. when you read my interpretation, and you can go look at anybody else's interpretation, you're going to see that mine fits much better than anybody else in the past. And look, it's not that they're bad teachers, but without Israel becoming a nation, there's no way you can interpret those two prophecies. It's interesting you that you say that. It's interesting you say that because um, I've talked about this with Watchful uh, pretty extensively. Actually, it was one of the first conversation points that we had when our show started is that the formation of Israel in 1948 marked the generation that would see Christ's return. Now, that fig tree verse in Matthew 24 doesn't directly say that, but that was my interpretation of it. And it's interesting to hear you say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's what Jesus was saying, you know, um, about the fig tree is when you see Israel become a nation, that generation will not pass away until he comes back. Yep, I agree. Right. And that generation is at the end of the road. That's my that's my parents generation. That's King Charles's generation. And look at the timeline as far as their age. So it's it, it all makes sense. Yes, uh, I, I I encourage you guys. If um, where can they find your book? Well, you can get it on Amazon. Now, there's other books called "Time Is Running Out." Just make sure it's the one that says "Time Is Running Out." Am I really in good standing with God? Uh, and then also, I have a website, "Time Is Running Out," the book.com that you can visit. You can read some of my blogs. If you like my blogs, you're going to really love my book. All right. Cool. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on and and uh, helping us understand the, you know, your book and um, your intentions for writing it. Uh, I would love to talk with you again in the future. It's it'd be great to hear more of your thoughts on where we are with things, and it's always a blessing to hear the perspectives of other followers of the way. Yeah, no, look, gentlemen, both of you, Christopher, Watchful, I appreciate you having me here. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm very passionate to get the truth out and to wake people up because yeah. time's running out and we don't have yeah, a lot of time. Right. And when Jesus returns, it's too late. You're, you're, you're exactly right. And it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because every one of his true followers are saying the exact same thing. The same message is being put out to his people. And for the folks that asked me in the message earlier, how do I know that I'm truly saved? It really is all about that personal relationship with Christ. If you have that daily devotion, that intimate relationship with him, essentially how I explained it, where your interaction with him is somewhat like the interaction with your spouse. That's what he's looking for. The, the folks that go uh, a day or two without, you know, it's imagine if you were married and going a day or two, not talking to your wife and that, that wouldn't fly. You would be uh, looking at divorce court. So you have to kind of compare that with your relationship to your spouse and how you would expect your spouse to be happy with you. That's the best I can yep. put it in words. You know, another thing I'd like to add to that is, you know, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> is, um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, so, you know, if you're reading the Bible, if you're reading it just for information, chances are you may not be saved. But if you're reading it for transformation, you're reading it because you know you're broke and you want to change and you want to please God, 
then you know there's a good chance that you're saved yeah because a lot of people just read it for information they just want to be able to quote verses do this but what they learned on sunday they don't apply it on monday through saturday yeah no i mean uh, you're absolutely right because your relationship with christ that will change your daily interactions and you know, things that you once struggled you with are. yeah well uh daniel thank you so much for coming on uh kip if you're in the chat um you're up next and uh, i look forward to having you back on the show daniel if you're yeah, okay anytime, coming back guys. on okay well fantastic yeah anytime. okay all right thank you all thank you all right, thanks Bye. daniel you're welcome Bye. Yeah, that was, uh, he was neat. I enjoyed uh, yeah. hearing what he had to say. I actually wish we had more time to talk to him. Um, yeah. It's um, it's interesting to hear his translation of the fig tree in Matthew as well, because uh, yeah. I've get I've received pushback on, on that um, over time, but that's just how I read it. But Yeah, I was just talking to one of my Jewish friends last night about the... Um, uh, he said, if you want to study anything, because we were talking about Jews and Judaism and the different sects, how they have different, you know, variations. Uh, but Judaism in and of itself hasn't really changed. And uh, he even he himself is fascinated by, you know, Israel becoming, uh, you know, a nation in a day in 1948 and how it's the only nation to do that. Yeah. Hey, Kim. Yeah. Hello, honey. Hey, how are you guys? Good. Is um, is the uh, the the gentleman in the chat that we mentioned um, in question? Is there an issue? No. Okay. All right. Just double checking. No. Not not that I know not, of. Not, not that yet. I know of. All right. Anyways. <laughs> The topic of your conversation is really interesting. And what's really interesting about this watchful is I had no idea that this was her topic topic for tonight. And when I got home from work, I watched a very lengthy video on the topic for tonight. And it's not a video that you see uh, by multiple authors. This is uh, a diamond in the rough. It's it, the, the happenstance of actually running across this video is not um, the odds are very low. It's about Nashville. And um, when she emailed me the information for tonight, I was like, Kip, I'm watching a video about this. <laughs> it, it, and and there, no one else is talking about this. So the odds of accidentally, it's just it's uh, interesting. And if you guys remember yesterday when I got home from work, there was a movie on that I walked through the door and it was about the wheats and the tares. And I told you how mm -hmm. odd that was. When I got up this morning, my TV was on and a different movie called The Life of Jesus was on. It was in the same spot. Are you sure your kids aren't messing with you? <laughs> no. No. I think that means you're supposed to teach they on that. I think that means you're supposed I'm to teach that's cool. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, it was the it was the TV in the bedroom this time. It was a different TV, and the TV was off. You know, I think I either left it on or something, or it might have been off. But the bottom line is, when I woke up, you know, eight hours, five hours later, it was a totally different movie playing, but at the exact same part of the story. Weird. You know what that proves. <laughs> We're living in a simulation. <laughs> it's the matrix. Well, what it, what it proves to me is theories, one of my favorite theories is that we are in some kind of a simulation. And I know that might sound weird because you probably think like a video game or something like run by a computer, like the matrix. But if you think about it, God doesn't change. So we know that from the scripture. So if he put together all these rules and systems, you know, the, the law of gravity and, you know, the law of, you know, reciprocity, there's all these physics, you know, science, the things that make our reality. Um, he, he built these things and he put it into a self-contained system that um, is perfect. So in a, in a way, he, 
even our reality literally is a simulation because, you know, from what we know about the end result is we're going to be eternal. So we're in a, we're in a simulation where things um, are under a curse where they degrade and, um, you know, die. Well, well it's God simulation. simulation. He knows the, he knows the beginning yeah. and the end. We win the game because uh, death is conquered. You know, death was conquered by his son. So we win, we win the simulation in the end. <laughs> yeah. So and, what and that, that what that tells me. Time, he, he conquered sin and death. This time he's coming to conquer the, the demonic. The wicked. Realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. what that tells me, whatever has happened over the last few days is, um, and I think this is happening uh, across a mass amount of people that are paying attention, but God is speaking yeah. very loudly to folks. It's, it's, it's a constant everyday occurrence for me now, seeing stuff like this, that every day I scratch my head. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Stuff that I did not notice before, uh, or at least the frequency of it. So it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just really neat. I mean, what's the odds of, uh, I don't need to repeat myself, but it, it's, it's interesting. Oh, my daughter's knocking at the door. I'm going to cut to my other screen. So you guys started out talking about the, the, um, the bridge collapse. And so that's kind of where I'm going to start tonight. I've got four different topics and they all kind of melt together. And we're going to finish up with Nashville because that is, (laughs) it's stunning. (laughs) I remember Mm -hmm. when I was researching the 2017 eclipse uh, and it went right over Nashville. Um, I came up with a great piece of information that I'm going to share with you guys tonight, but I found it too late. Um, I found it after the eclipse. And so... loud i have no idea what that happened i I was gonna Uh, sing for y'all that was that was so weird um (laughs) my daughter queen (laughs) yeah my daughter came to the door and i took my uh airpods out for a second and when i put them back in i must have double tapped them and it turned on itunes and the first song was (laughs) dancing queen which is what i used to put my daughter to sleep when she was little for some reason, that song would put her to sleep. That was so weird. <laughs> Come on, be honest. That's what you work out to. We now, when we, yeah, now we know that, your music that you work yeah. out to. That's my jam. I totally get down to Dancing Queen. <laughs> it is. So anyway, right. I just really for tonight, I've really got to thank one of our regular viewers. And I can't remember who it was because the chat flies so fast. But um, they, they alerted us to the fact that, yes, the ship's name is Dolly. And it's, it's named for Salvador Dali, who is a, a painter, from, and he's Spanish. And let's throw up graphic number one so we can get a good look of Salvador Dali, who this guy is that this ship is named after. Let's see, graphic number now, wow, <laughs> that guy. And what does it say? It says, each morning when I awake, I experience again a supreme pleasure that of being Salvador Dali. Wow. 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 So that's Salvador Dali. I guess that's loving others as you love yourself. So he's loving himself. That's not a bad thing, right? That's happy to be who he is. Okay. Well, that could be pride. That could be pride. Can be. Take take the mustache off. And I've got two thoughts on who this guy really looks like. I'm going to rock that mustache. That's, that is, uh, (laughs) I can can, can actually do that with my beard. This mustache off who he would look like Oops. Tom Hanks. <laughs> he would oh, look yeah. like Tom Hanks. he might even sure. look like Mark Zuckerberg. Either way, the guy's a little creepy looking. Well, he is famous for painting uh, a, a picture about the Spanish Civil War six months before it happened. It's called the soft construction with boiled beans. Don't ask me what that's about. It's a weird picture and I did not put it in here because it's got some connotations uh, we shouldn't put up on the screen. All of his, all of his stuff does. Uh, but this guy is known not only, not only for prophesying the Spanish Civil War, but mm. uh, he's known for tarot cards and other alchemist magic to get his inspiration. So this is not a guy who's, 
who's painting from the light side, he's painting from the light side of the dark side. So, um, and his paintings are mashups of religion and mysticism. Many of them depict Christ. And there's even a really creepy one called the Ecumenical Council. If you guys want to look these things up, just go to Wikipedia. There's also all the links for the research tonight are down in the, um, in the description box. So anything you guys want to go look at is down there. So um, yeah, just look up Wikipedia and you can click on all of his paintings. So uh, his best known painting is The Persistence of Memory. Um, and, and that's graphic number two. Let's throw that one on. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows this one. Well, sure. it's about how time is fluid. Hmm. And what do you see, Watchful? What do you see when you look at it? Melting clocks and ants on a clock. Yeah. So there's four different clocks. They're telling us that there's four different dimensions and that time is relevant to the observer. And then you don't know if that's sunrise or sunset. It's just, it's all about time running all together and, and the dimensions, right? Hmm. So now our friend in the chat alerted us to two lesser known, but very timely paintings by our friend, Mr. Dolly. The first is called The Broken Bridge and the Dream, and the second is known as The First Days of Spring. Now, if we stop and we think about our, our ship crash, The Broken Bridge, broken bridge. And, uh -huh, and The First Days of Spring. We are in the first days of spring. So let's look at graphic number three. Let's look at Dolly's Broken Bridge. Okay, guys, this is creepier than creepy. Um, it, it, wow. yeah. So at the top of this, really Christopher, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have no idea why it's doing that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Because that I'm is fabulous. The, because that I'm is the the Because I can dance. I just want you to know that. I had to run back to my office. I was like, uh, I was, I didn't even touch anything this time. I was literally dealing with my daughter and then the music started playing in my ear. I about spit out my coffee. <laughs> Holy crap. Let's throw graphic number three back up real quick. Oh my goodness. Sorry, guys. Guys, not only do we have the white horse up on top of the bridge leading oh, people right to their doom, and they're dancing and prancing and, and following. Of dancing queen. <laughs> yes. They're they're all over the place in this in this uh, painting. So not only is there a a almost translucent white horse with a skeletal rider leading these people off this broken bridge. But it's really hard to see. You've got to actually, you know, blow the painting up a little bit. In, are, you in, sure, are you sure that's not green? Because green well, is the, death followed by hell. Because it looks kind of green to me. I see what you get with them being transparent. Well, when you look at the brush strokes for what he's putting on, it's, he's putting white on, but there is a green one in the distance. It's so small, you can barely see it. Um, yeah, yeah, you're almost there. So there's a green one in the distance. And in between, we have uh, people dancing with and and uh, uh, making out with, I guess. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I don't know how else to say it. Oh, yeah, the angels. The angels. With yeah, fallen angels, and then there's the women, there's the angels. Mm hmm. Weird. Yep. Yeah. And huh. so, and right up above the white horse, which is the the first seal, is it not? Is it the first seal? Mm hmm. Yeah. The Kay. first seal is a white horse. Yeah. So, so the first seal of, of Revelation, right above it, there's a little something. I can't tell what it is. Is it, what, is, what do you think that is? Is, is it a right bird? Here? A a bird. No, you were right on. It's that little, it's a disc. It's almost like a little disc, hmm. like a UFO. So we have fallen angels and women. Hmm. How did we get Nephilim half breeds? 
That's exactly how. Um, and what do we know? As in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the end. Well, in the days of Noah, what was going on? There was fornication between um, the, the fallen angels and women to, to make those Nephilim and half breeds. So this, this has a lot of crazy symbolism. Now let's look at the, the first days of spring. Is that this one? Yeah. And I wish, yeah, yeah there's some stuff. Yeah. So this is very strange. I don't know if this the, one is safe for YouTube. Um, it may blur be. this one out. So, um, if you want to take that down really quick, we can tell people to go there on their own. Yeah, go down look at that one the on the wiki. Corner, yeah, down in the corner, there's a trans man, uh, which back when this was painted in the 1960s, trans people were, were not a, a big deal. I mean, you, you, you had transvestites, people who dressed up. This is no somebody who's not dressing up. He's actually changed. Um, and then there's a man with his head on this trans man's shoulder, and he has a white mask over his mouth, just like our COVID masks, right? Mm. So it's funny because the, the two roads that are going towards the beach, they almost turn into stairs, but they're, they're still roads. It's really strange. I can't tell what it is, but, um, but it's going off into this ditch, and off to the left, you have this man sitting in a chair looking out into nothing, ignoring everything behind him. I think that's pretty representative of most people. We're, we've been ignoring for years what's happening right in front of us and or right behind us. We just turn our back on it. We don't want to look. We don't want to see the day that we're living in. Now, here's, here's the thing. When I first saw that, uh, that painting, um, we were talking on our, our signal chat, and J Joel is going to be doing a a talk on Hollywood predictive programming. And I am telling you what the the show that he's going to be really focusing on on the third, right? He's going to be on the third. This um, not sure I could go look. Yeah, I think it's the third. So this this painting is really kind of many of the themes from that movie are also in this painting. And this painting is connected back again to a giant cyber attack on our nation, um, the the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, yeah. And Salvador Dali, who is obviously um, from the dark side. So Joel is on Tuesday the 2nd. Tuesday the 2nd. Okay. So guys, you want to be here Tuesday the 2nd for Joel. He has got some awesome stuff. So now you guys have the picture of that eclipse up. So let's change subjects and we're going to talk about the eclipse. But what no one's talking about is what's the prophetic word over Mexico, right? We're all focused on America, but is there a word for the nation of Mexico? There is. Okay. So here's the deal. So the eclipse is going to come screaming into the nation of Mexico at 1,561 miles per hour. Well, Strong's Greek 1561 is the word ekdichia, which is expectation. So something's coming, expectancy. The time of totality over, um, over the nation as it's coming in is... Um, Four minutes, 27 seconds. Well, uh, I was doing some research on 427 scriptures, and the first one that came up was Proverbs 421. Do not turn to the left or the, or, or the right. Remove your foot from evil. So the width of the, the eclipse of the path of totality is 123.3 miles at landfall. Well, Psalms 123. Point three says, have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Now, that's one of the songs of ascent, a song, a song of ascension or going up. And it's it's literally a, a prayer for relief from your enemies. Um, is that talking about Israel? Because, boy, Israel needs the Lord to have mercy on them because yeah, they are... I'm against them right now. 
Even yeah. the United States is starting to turn against them. Yeah, well, and we the government. Have... I don't know about the not all, not the people, not all the people anyway. Well, not all the people and not all the churches. There are a lot of churches that stand with Israel and will always stand with Israel. And I'm Amen. very fortunate that that every church I've been I've gone to supports Israel. We support Amen. Israel. But uh, and we also know from Bill Koenig's work um, that every time we try to force a two state solution, uh, judgment comes to America. We're doing it again. Right. So now the first place that this eclipse on April 8th touches land on, uh, well, actually touches um, Mexico is Isla Socorro and Socorro means help help and it's part of a four island archipelago 600 miles off the coast and there's only 250 people on uh isla socorro and uh it's a naval base so the totality there is three minutes 33 seconds well what is john 333 he who has received his testimony has certified that god is true so we're talking John here. John is the one that received the testimony. What are the other three islands that, that this eclipse goes right over? Isla San Juanito, St. John, Isla Maria Madre, Mother Mary, and Isla Maria Magdalena, Mary Magdalene. All three of these people were at the cross. They were at the cross. And this is... You know, just for for you and I, this is Resurrection Weekend. So, so now the 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 eclipse is going to come into the state of Sinaloa. Now, Sinaloa is the most brutal and well known of all drug trafficking cartels. So, and nice. this Sinaloa, yeah, the Sinaloa cartel is is big bad news. So, surprisingly, Sinaloa means round fruit means nothing. But I'm telling you what, uh, we all know about the Sinaloa cartel. So it's going to come into the state of Sinaloa and it will first touch land at Mazatlan. Mazatlan is right in the center of totality. And Mazatlan means land of the deer. And in the Bible, deer are all about peace, and beauty, and swiftness. So now it's going to make landfall at 11.42 a.m. Well, Luke 11.42 says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. Those who ought to, those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So that's Jesus rebuking the Pharisees for having no love for people, having no love for God. All they cared about was this is what the scripture says and we're keeping, we're checking the boxes. They checked the boxes, but they didn't love. So that's, that is one of the prophetic warnings uh, that has to do with the time at landfall over, over Mexico. And then uh, John eleven forty two 42 is the calling of Lazarus, you know, calling the dead things to life. Yes. Come on, let's do that. King Jesus. Okay. Now, uh, four minutes and, oh, there's going to be four minutes and 20 seconds of totality. Matthew 4.20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Romans 4.20, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Nehemiah 4.20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Are you guys starting to see a theme? It's this or that there's no in between it's you love and follow the lord you obey his voice or you don't so it's it's putting a choice before the people so the next city that it goes through is caliente de grate which is heat of grace then via union house of unity el rosario the rosary Isla del Bosque, Island of the Forest, and San Ignacio, which is the Saint of Fire. So we've got some really cool prophetic names in there. And then we go to the state of Durango. Well, Durango means well-watered place, mainly because the Sierra Madre uh, Mountains are there, which is the Mother Mountain Range. 
So in the very first town that it hits in in Durango is uh, is uh, oh yeah is Durango, which um, which has seven hundred thousand people, same as Mazatlan, um, and Durango means water town. Oh, the first place it hits is El Salto. Sorry, guys, is El Salto, God of Salt. God of Salt. <laughs> Anybody thinking Lot's wife or be the salt of the earth? There's there's a dichotomy right there. What are you? Do you want to be salt, uh, Lot's wife looking back at the world and longing for the evil that's in it? Or do you want to be the salt of the earth and bring in a harvest of souls for the Lord? Right? So uh, at Durango, which means water town, um, water in dreams is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So um, three, 50 se- three minutes, 50 seconds of totality. There's only one 350 um, scripture in the whole Bible and it's Lamentations 350. So the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. So he's watching us. He looks down and he sees. He, he's, he wants us. He wants us to turn to him. He is watching for someone who loves him. So some of the other towns in Durango are Nuevo Ideal, which is New Standard, Conant Lawn, Home Beside the Water, Um, Nombre de Dios, the name of God, Uh, Gomez Palacio, Man's Palace, El El Lucero, the light, and Tuajelo de Zaragoza, the hand that waters. And what's the hand that waters? That's the hand of God, right? And that's also a challenge to us, come to think about it. What did Jesus say? If if you gave a cup of cold water to the least of these, you gave it to me. You and I are supposed to be the hand that waters. The Lord is the hand that waters us, and we're supposed to water those who don't know him to draw them in. That's So you and I, that's a challenge to, to you guys uh, and to me too. Be the hand that waters. So the third state that this that this uh, eclipse goes through is Coahila, which means, unfortunately, flying serpent, dragon, right? And the very first city and the largest city in this whole section of, of uh, Mexico is Torreon. And Torreon means large tower. Yeah. (laughs) So we know how God feels about large towers. The Tower of Babel was just one of those things, right? So it means large tower. And this is a town of uh, 1.5 million people. And it's known for mining and farming and ranching. It's got a lot of water. It's, it's, there's a lot there. So Torreon is, is a pretty big city. So, but large tower in the flying serpent state, that's, pretty prophetic guys. So some of the other towns are San Pedro de las Colonias, the colonies of St. Peter, Lagoon del Rey, Legion of the King, Allende, which means on the other side. And that's where, that's where I'd like to be on the other side. (laughs) Um, And Allende is known for, uh, 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 it's, it's 1969 Allende meteorite. So a big meteorite hit there. It's actually the most studied uh, meteorite in the world. So we know most of the things that we know about space from this Allende meteorite. And and hold on to that thought of meteorites because more is coming. So then again, we have Zaragoza, Hand, Guerrero, Warrior, Ciudad Acuna, City in the Wedge or Standing in the Gap. And that's what we need to do for the the lost sheep in our families, the lost sheep in our lives. And then finally, the last city in Mexico is Piedras Negras. It's right across from Eagle Pass. They are sister cities, Piedras Negras, Black Rock. Black Rock. How's that set with you, watchful? (laughs) That name stirs up. suspicious intense considering they own the world they do they do so it's black rock state street and who's the other one that's interesting 
There's, um, there's three major financial corporations that own almost everything. And they pull the strings. As a matter of fact, BlackRock has been buying up the majority of single family homes throughout America since 2020, when the pandemic. Vanguard, that's the other one. So when the pandemic hit and people lost jobs and lost houses and blah, blah, oh man, guess who was in there snapping them up? They were outbidding yeah. uh, people for them. And, uh, oh, yeah. and the whole thought is, guess who you're going to pay a pretty penny to rent your house from? Because remember what Klaus Schwab told us, you will own nothing and be happy by the year 2030. Well, we're, we're six years away from his promise that we will own nothing. BlackRock and, and Klaus will own everything, right? So, yeah. so the, uh, the eclipse at this point where it goes over BlackRock into America. So um, uh, uh, it's going 1,587 miles an hour. So it's actually speeding up. It's sped up 26 miles per hour over the entrance, right? So Strong's Greek 1587 is exclipio, which is to cease, to cease. Okay, well, what's happening right there at that place? We're ceasing to have a border. They are erasing Asclepi our border. Did you just say that aslepio is the Greek word for cease? Ekliepo. E E K oh, that's different. Okay. It's not a Sclepio, like a Sclepius the scissors. Well, I was thinking of um a Slepio the serpent, which Ophiuchus is holding in the constellations, which is the god of tox or they they worshipped him as the god of of, of health, um, and also <laughs> toxinology and toxicology. Mm -hmm. But I I think I misheard the word you said. Yeah, and, and I, I probably didn't pronounce it very well. But and, and it's funny you would bring that up because that NDE guy the other day, um, and he, I can't remember how you say his name, uh, Dom, Domniac, uh, something like that. Uh, no, that was no, he was, you, you got it. The, the yeah, hell NDE, yeah, yeah, the hell NDE, which was just chilling, guys. It was chilling. Um, go back and watch it if you missed it. He was talking about this place in hell that he saw for just a minute. And then the finger of God barely touched him and he was back in his body. They were literally, they, they literally were taking him. I mean, he was in the morgue. They were, <laughs> they were transferring him from the morgue because that's how dead this guy was. But when he was in hell, the finger of God touched him and, and he was back, back in his body. But he got to this place in hell, this deep, dark place with this great big ancient gate. And what was on that ancient gate, but the the serpents that we think of as health. Yes. Man, That's that NDE was, that was a chilling, chilling story. But yeah, I thought the same thing when he um, mentioned the, the sign on the ancient gate uh, was just like you said, the symbol for health care. And man, uh, it, my hair stood up on the back of my neck and, um, I've heard similar stories just like that from so many of them. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's, yeah. you know, I, I, folks tell me not to focus on it, but it, it puts the fire <laughs> of the Lord. It puts the fire yeah. of the Lord in me yeah. because That'd I don't, be I don't want, I don't want anyone that I know to go there. Yeah. Well, okay, so this this eclipse is is coming into America at 1,587 miles per hour. The Strong's Greek Concordus is eclipo to cease. Um, and the, the verse that that comes from is Luke 23, 45. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Hmm. That's, that's the day Jesus died. The sun was darkened. Now, there's no record of an eclipse at that time. Nobody knows what that was, but it was not natural. God himself had to darken the sun. Well, I mean, here we are. We're talking about an eclipse where the sun is darkened. So um, I find that super interesting that uh, Luke 23, 45 is connected with 
the speed of the eclipse going in from Mexico into America. And Strong's Hebrew uh, 1587 is Yah has accomplished. So um, it's the word Gemar, Gemar Yah, Yah has accomplished. So, and the eclipse exits Mexico at 1227 PM exactly and enters America. Hebrews 1227 is now, now this yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain so the question is are you going to be shaken at what's coming after this eclipse or are you going to stand firm and remain god is looking for people who know him who love him who stand on his goodness on his word on his character, um, who cannot be shaken because they love him. So, yeah. And then John 12, 27, Jesus predicts his own death on the cross. Yeah. So, um, let's see. There's a lot more guys. I could tell you like four or five more 12, 27s that would just blow your mind. But, but here's what I think is even more important is the path right there. It narrows. So, it narrows to 120.9 miles wide. It was 123.3, but now the path is narrowing. Well, what is that prophetically? It's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go into it. Guys, this... This X, this cutting of the nation, it's it's a choice. God is is asking us, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Now, this is kind of cool because uh, Steve, Pastor Steve Chicolante, uh, I like like Christopher, like Watchful. I really take a good look at what pops up on my YouTube feed, YouTube feed, what pops up on my Instagram, because I'm not looking for anything. You know, it comes to me. And Pastor Steve Chicolante popped up. Absolutely. Made, I love that man. I well, love it's that. Not, what you just said is more important. I, I do not go hunting for anything. And my feed, literally, I feel like God is directing my feed because... <laughs> I will not have to hunt for anything and stuff that we will talk about one night the next morning it'll be there or just for example that the topic that you're going into here shortly it just happened <laughs> yeah. to be the it happened to be the first video on my feed and I was mm -hmm. like I've never heard about that well yeah. watch that and then you uh, literally 10 minutes later my email goes off and it's about that it was just you know it's I'm you're right telling you it's funny, within the last couple of months, Steve Chicolante has popped up on my feed twice. And I decided, I finally decided, okay, I'm just going to hit subscribe. <laughs> but he Oh, made I a like him. Yeah. He, he made a really amazing point about eclipses that everyone else has missed. I missed it. I missed it. I'm so grateful that he brought it out. So um, let's take graphic number six. We can, we can go back and forth between six and seven. Okay. So what is that? Um, I don't know what flag it is, but it's a uh, looks like an eclipse and a star. That's right. Okay, we've been told our whole lives that that's a crescent moon. It's a crescent moon. It's a crescent moon. It's a crescent moon. Islam's symbol has never been a crescent moon. It is mm. an annular eclipse because the inside circle is not the same size as the outside circle you hit the other one it doesn't matter what direction it goes what color it is that is an annular eclipse just like the one that we saw on september 14th of 2023 the one that just came in at gardner oregon went across all the dry and uninhabited places and came out at the body of christ corpus christi texas refugio and victoria so, oh, and Padre Island, Padre Island was right there too. So that was a great word for the church. And that cut America in half. We've had three eclipses in seven years that have cut America in half. 
it didn't go over a little tiny area it cut us in half so but anyway so uh, some people believe that that this is a sign or a prophetic warning that Muslims are going to invade. I don't know that there will be terrorist attacks. I do not know, but I can tell you this. Our job as the church is to pray against evil, is to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our job is to resist. So guys, join me in praying against these demonic attacks. Uh, especially by by uh, the Muslims, who we know are <laughs> infiltrating our country uh, through that southern border mostly. So, um, but if you want to see that video by Steve Chicolante, it's the link is down below. So, and, so, and here's another kind of fun fact too: both Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Supreme Leader of Iran Ali Khamenei were born during eclipses. Hmm. Yeah. So we have this eclipse, this overshadow, this, this foreshadowing and this overshadowing happening over and over and over again. And we know that in the Bible, that is called the sign of Jonah. Now, when Jesus said that to the Pharisees, he, they knew what he was talking about. They knew he was talking about the eclipse over Nineveh. They knew that. They had no idea that he was going to rise again uh, in th you know three days. They had no clue that that was going to happen. So that's not what he was talking about. He was telling them, I'm going to give you the sign of an eclipse because you are a wicked and adulterous generation. You demand a sign. You refuse to believe in me. You just want signs. And so he told them that's what they were going to get was an eclipse. And after the, the Bursa, Bursa Gale eclipse, um, there was an earthquake. So they were expecting an eclipse and an earthquake. And that's exactly what they got. Now, by, by rising three days later, he also prophetically fulfilled that three days in the belly of the fish. So that was kind of a double whammy. But but for all you who are saying, oh, that sign, that's, that's the three days in the belly of the fish. Yes, it is. But for the Pharisees at that time who didn't know what was coming in the future, they knew exactly what the sign of Jonah was. So yeah, there's, there's two different manif manifestations and two different fulfillments there. And that is crazy, 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 crazy cool. So now we're going to get into Nashville. Now all of this stuff kind of goes together because Nashville um, is not in the path of totality of this eclipse. Yet it was in the path of totality in 2017. So this year on the 8th, Nashville will be in about 90 to 95 percent of the eclipse. So it's not in the path of totality, but it's pretty close. It's pretty close. They're going to see a little a little rim of the, the of the sun sticking out. So. So that was one of the most overlooked pieces of information in 2017 was that Nashville, Tennessee was was in the path of totality. And I totally missed it until afterwards. And I was like, oh, you know, so why, why is this important? important? So, so Nashville. Boom. Yikes. What yeah. There? It, it, this is getting deep, guys. <laughs> Nashville is known as the Athens of the South. And it used to be called the Athens of America because of the sheer number of colleges and universities and stuff that they have there. And they're very, very proud of that that higher education is their thing, just like in Athens, Greece. So they were capitalizing on that moniker. And so the city set about building an exact scale model of, guess what? Graphic eight. <laughs> Throw up graphic eight, can you? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Greek Parthenon. Yes, in, 19, in the 1930s, the cities had an anniversary celebration and they actually built the Greek Parthenon. And if you look on the roof, there is a, a Roman god or a Roman centurion up there. 
right? So, um, yeah. So that's what they, they thought was really a wise thing to do in the 1930s. Well, since then, the Parthenon has been rebuilt in concrete. That's graphics 9 and 10, if you can put those up. So there you go. A full-scale replica in the United States of America. The Greek Parthenon. It is owned and operated by the Metropolitan Board of Parks and Rec Recreation, and they have regular e educational events there. People flock to this place. So it is the world's only exact size detail replica of the original. So what is the Parthenon? You guys might not, not recognize this at first. It's a giant temple to the Greek goddess Athena. So we know that Athena, if she's a goddess and not a Nephilim, is a fallen angel. She's a fallen angel. And I hate to say, so for all of you who say there's no such thing as, as female angels, well, I don't, there's Athena. There's Athena. I'm not going to argue about it. I'm just telling you it, it's Athena. So, but anyway, so the goddess Athena. So in Roman culture, she's known as Minerva. So this is the same god, just different names. She very well could be Isis or something like that. Or in, in uh, Egyptian culture, I did not look that up, I, I have to admit. So, and she is the goddess of war, handicraft, and practical reason. And she is also known as the protectress of the city. The, protect, the protectress of the city, the protector. First off, guys, this flies in the very face of who God is. God is a father. He is a father and he is a protector. He is a provider. Um, this is saying, we don't need you, God. We're going to trust in this fallen angel, this, this pagan symbol. We're going to trust in it instead. So, you know, when Jesus came to earth, he said he came to demonstrate the father. So, and, and the father was a huge new revelation to people, especially the Jews. So now, according to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Bible Theology, the word, the name father is only used for God 15 times in the Old Testament. Ouch, 15 times, that's it. Even worse, only one, peop, one person in the Old Testament actually called God father, and that was Isaiah. He did so twice. So only Isaiah saw God as a father. People did not see God as a father at all. They saw him as a judge. And so um, it's a really, really big deal to God that Jesus came and demonstrated him as father because the people did not understand that. That was a whole new revelation that God was a loving, good, gentle, kind father. Jesus is the warrior. The Holy Spirit is the comforter and the spirit of truth and the healer. God is a father. And here they, they say, we're, we're going to worship the, the protectress of our city is going to be Athena. The god, goddess of war is going to be our protector. When they have the goodness and the mercy of Father God and they refuse it. So... Anyway, now the second thing that popped out to me other than the protectress of the city and that flies right in the face of Father God being their protector. He, if he has a hand of protection over them, they're lucky folk. <laughs> so the second thing that came to mind is Athena is a civilized city dweller. That's what she's known as, the builder of cities. So um, she is following in the mold of Cain who built cities for people to congregate, as well as Nimrod, right? Who built the ultimate city, Babel, so that people could be of one mind and they could challenge God and they could, they could build up to the heavens so that they could access the fallen angels and the technology that they wanted from them. They didn't, they were not building that tower up to get closer to God. They weren't necessarily building it to to glorify themselves, they were reaching for the pagan demonic realm. That's what they were doing. So, 
So here's the big question. Oh, well, and Babylon, Babylon rose again during the, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's going to come back here in just a minute. So is America or even Nashville a Babylon? It seems so, unfortunately. It seems so that we are Babylon of Revelation 17, 18. You know, it's, it's kind of scary there. So here's where it gets really hairy, guys. So this is what popped up on my feed. And I was like, what? I've never heard this. So there are prophetic dreams of the destruction of Nashville. There are a lot of them. Now, there was a video on YouTube by a, a guy named Don Frost, who has been researching this for years. And he's logged dozens of prophetic dreams of Nashville's destruction. And uh, it really started with a really profound dream in 1904. Um, and let's take a look at that. That's going to be number 13. Okay. So here's the dream. There was a scene presented to me. Oh, and I'm sorry. This was from 1904. This was a lady in 1904. There was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath. That is when the scene was presented. I looked out the window and there was an immense ball of fire that had come from heaven. And it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars, especially the pillars were presented to me. And it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out, branching out, enlarging. And they began to cry and mourn and mourn and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood by there saying, well, it is just what we have been expecting. Hmm. It is just but what we have been talking about. It is just what we have been talking about. Others turned and said, you knew it, said the people. You knew it and you never told us. I thought there was such an agony in their face, such an agony in their appearance. So this was part of this dream. Now, there's there's a lot more to this dream and you'd have to look up the video to to see the rest of the dream but this is this is the the biggest part of it is the pillars a, a cast they were casting pillars well that's exactly what they did here so we've got a ball of fire we've got it shooting lightning as it descends it's burning buildings and when it hits it destroys this parthenon and sends out fire tendrils throughout the city. Well, what's inside the Parthenon? What's inside that place? The statue of Athena. And guys, I'm not kidding you. It, it, you can't tell how big this is. It's about three stories tall. It is the largest indoor statue in the, the Western Hemisphere. It's huge. Uh, if there was a person standing next to it, it would be about mm, ankle high. It's this thing is gigantic. And surprisingly, the person who who made this statue, um, he decided to put his own face on it. So that's a man's face, guys. Got a little trans thing going in here again. So yeah. So here we are. We're back to Babylon. We're back to Babylon. Here's this giant golden statue. Hmm. Does that remind you of of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Not only does Nebuchadnezzar build a giant gold statue to himself, he has a prophetic dream about a giant statue, doesn't he? So the wise men have to tell him the dream and interpret it, okay? Because he wants the truth. He doesn't want anybody blowing sunshine up his, his royal skirt. So he is demanding that the, his wise men, his dream interpreters, tell him the dream as well. And if they don't, he's going to kill all of the wise men. So the wise men, they can't do it, they know. And so they run right to Daniel. And Daniel goes to the royal vizier and says, hey, can you give me some time? I need to go to my God and I will ask him. And so they gave him some time. And then who did he go to? I think this is so cool. And a lot of people miss this. I know I missed it for years. Daniel asked him for time to seek his God. And then he asks Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
his companions to pray with him. Who are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That's who they are. The very people who refused to bow at the first golden statue are the ones praying for Daniel about the golden statue dream. The second golden statue, that is. Whoa, ha. Huh. So God gives him an answer. And so in Daniel 2.27, which guys remember, back in the uh, Mexican eclipse, one of those times was 2.27. So Daniel 2.27 says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare this to the king. So in other words, man has no answers. You know, the demonic realm has no answers. The demonic realm could not tell the king his dream. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he had may, has made known to, known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. In the latter days. Now, when we're talking about the latter days, we're talking about our time. Now, we know that this prophecy was fulfilled um, in that, I think it was through like the first century. It was, it was, it, it has been fulfilled once. It will be fulfilled again. And it says so right here in verse 28, that he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar that will be in the latter days. He's talking about us guys. So you, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was made of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. It broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So this is a meteor coming down. And we know that this meteor was the stone that was cut without human hands. It's the stone the builders rejected. Jesus. It's this, this is, this is significant, um, symbolic of Jesus. So this was fulfilled once and it will be fulfilled again. Could it be fulfilled in Nashville? It very well could be. So let's take a look at, at graphic number 14. Is that 14? No, it's the Tennessee uh, Titans yeah. logo. Oh, there you go. Woohoo! Hmm, the Tennessee Titans. What are Nephilim half-breeds? They are Titans. Hmm. Back to this pagan worship again. The Tennessee Titans in a meteorite with three stars. Well, I didn't know this until Chris told me today that um, there are three meteor strikes. There's actually four, but they think that one of them uh, is the same meteor that it split at the last minute. But there's, there's at least three meteor strikes around Nashville already. Nobody knows when they were, you know, they can't really tell because um, unlike that big meteorite that, that struck um, above Winslow, Arizona, um, which is in the desert, you can really see it. It's a mile across. So it's, it's uh, uh, is that a diameter? It's diameter is uh, one mile. Um, these are eight miles, seven miles. And because it's so lush there and there, it's filled with trees and stuff, it took people a long time to realize, oh my gosh, these are meteor strikes. You can see it from, from Google Earth that that's what these are. So the Tennessee Titans, their logo and their name literally glorifies the demonic, the, the pagan. And it prophesies a meteor coming to town. Ah. Oh. You can't make this stuff up, guys. You can't make this stuff up. So, and the sad thing is Nashville had a prophetic destiny. 
and it's not fulfilling that prophetic destiny. It's encircled by Highway 444. Now, I know you guys, a lot of you guys are thinking, what are all these numbers about? Well, God loves numbers. He, he loves to weigh. He loves to measure. He loves to count and number. Um, it's all the way through scripture. As a matter of fact, there is a, an angel by the name of Palmoni who is, is in scripture and he is called the wonderful numberer of secrets. So numbers are a big deal to God. And it's one of the voices he uses to speak to people. And if you wake up in, at 333 or every time you look at the clock, it's 911 or, it, you know, God is speaking to you. Search those things out. And we can talk about that another another week, how to search out numbers, how to interpret dreams, that kind of thing, because this is stuff you need to do for yourself. You don't need to go to someone else for these things. You need to learn to do them yourself because it's about relationship. It's about seeking the Lord. So anyway, so back to that. Um, Highway 40, 444 goes around Nashville. Well, that 444 is the key of David. It's heaven's frequency. When David made his stringed instruments, they were all tuned to 444, right? It's a healing uh, a frequency. As a matter of fact, remember when King Saul was being tormented by, by a, a demon of depression, he would call for David and David would play his harp and the depression and the demon would leave. That's because it was tuned to 444, the frequency of heaven. Well, um, and that's also akin to uh, 528, uh, yeah, 528 hertz. So now we know this, our music has been hijacked by none other than the Rockefellers. Yes, who funds the symphonies and has for the last 150 years? The Rockefellers. And they have gotten the symphonies and the music industry to change tuning from 444, the frequency of heaven, to 440, which is a frequency of dissonance. It literally makes you sick. Kind of scary stuff, right? So, yeah. And it, 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 uh, it is not in rhythm with our hearts either. So, yeah, so that's just a few things about this 440. And that's what most of our music is in, even most of our worship music. Um, I know that Bethel has uh, been doing all of their music in 444. Now, I know there's a lot of Bethel haters out there, but I'm telling you, at least they're doing their music in 444 and not 440. So anyway... So now if you want to understand frequencies 444, there is a link to a video down below that you guys can go look for. And, and guys, there's hope because <laughs> my friend Beth from Australia, she's absolutely adorable. Um, she is a singer and she has the most angelic voice and she loves Jesus like no other. She is in Nashville as we speak and she has been... Um, uh, recording her her album dream coat and all of the songs are in 444 and her goal is to take back music for the lord so pray for my friend beth and her and her album dream coat i don't know when it's going to come out but uh but look for beth and in dream coats so anyway so here's here's the bottom line guys you know when it comes to to nashville not fulfilling its destiny. Nashville is supposed to be a place where the music of the Lord is brought forth in the frequency of heaven. And instead, this city demands to worship pagan culture, to have idols, uh, giant idols. Um, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. So, so here's the deal. If you don't fulfill your destiny, someone else will. And it's not going to be somebody good. I can tell you that. So there's two places in the Bible where beautiful young women were offered by a king anything you want up to half my kingdom. The first one was Esther. Esther was, was offered anything you want up to half my kingdom by her husband, the king. And what did she ask for? The head of Haman, the enemy. 
She saved her people. She stood up because what did Mordecai tell her? If you refuse to do this thing, do not think, do not think for a second that you will not perish. Help will come up from an, from another. Well, here's the problem when we don't fulfill our destinies and our calls and our purposes like Nashville is supposed to do. Um, there is another gal in scripture, a beautiful young woman who a king looked at and said, whatever you want, ask me for whatever you want up to half my kingdom. Her name was Salome and she asked for the head of John the Baptist. If you don't step into your prophetic destiny, if you do not step up and do what the Lord has asked you to do, there's a Salome waiting in the wings and it's not going to go good. It's not going to go good. Do not let Salome in. So that is most of what I have for you. I know Chris, Christopher mentioned that there's something to do with Mecca also in Nashville, but I, I'm not sure what that was. I don't know if he's going to come back or not, but but those are the things that I had for tonight, guys. So, and I'm just wondering, let me look into the chat and see if there are any questions. Whoa, okay, so I just popped back into the chat and it's going We have a lot of people watching tonight. So if you've got friends yeah. and family, Nashville, guys, remember our job is to pray against these things. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We pray against Amen. these things. We don't say, oh man, Nashville's going down in, in flames. Nashville, repent. Repent. So, yeah, I was just going to look and see. Yeah. Um, did you talk? The lady that had that dream. She's had lots of dreams, which is what's really interesting. Um, I, I can't remember if you went into that. I was focused on the chat. But she has had several, several dreams. And many of them have come to fruition. And if who's, I understand... Who's that? Who are you referring the, to? The, the lady the whole, who had the dream about Nashville and the meteorite coming and and hitting that Parthenon temple. Um, How far she away is Nashville dream. from Missouri? Because didn't Doctor Thrapp <laughs> say that if Missouri <laughs> doesn't, or if the United States doesn't repent, there was going to be a lot of earthquakes? And that isn't, aren't they well, on the same line? Um, they, Nash they Nashville's close. north of me by about three hours, but it's all. Um, Somewhat near the Madrid fault line. Um, right. I think Missouri is west of the Mississippi, where Nashville is east of the Mississippi. Um, okay, we need to look. We need to look into this because I want to track this because Doctor Thrapp uh, talked about the earthquakes, and now we have a dream talking about a meteor hitting Nashville. Um, and well, then if you if you look at Ben's work on um, the the solar flares and the weather, it's all in that same vein. The the dream in question is from a lady in the early 1800s that wrote a book, oh. and she predicted in her book in the video that I was watching today that they were going over it. She really um, nailed some of her predictions it was uh, kind of chilling actually um and yeah, they were all, they they were yeah, only talking about, about one of them slavery. which was what's that that one the one about slavery was was right yes. on yeah. where she said slavery would would be extinguished for a short while but it would rise again and that it would um benefit certain white people and and then they showed a video of of actual slaves in America today um, who are, are, and these were not sex slaves. Now we know that sex trafficking. No, they're slave working. And yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And Watchful brought this to my attention a few months ago. I was not aware of the epidemic of slavery, but the trafficking, the human trafficking is at the core of it. And like you said, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, sex slaves. These people are literally locked into the warehouse of where they work for years. 
yeah. uh, monitored by armed guards. And they number in the millions, in the millions. Uh, Nashville is one of the hot spots, and so is Atlanta for human trafficking and slavery. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, it is. They said that the the reason Nashville is is because of the the number of highways and how they come together and split back out. So it's yeah, it's a- that's it's exactly how Atlanta works too, which is where I'm near. Um, Nashville is just north of me, so but just like Atlanta, Atlanta when you get to Atlanta, you can go west on twenty. And head towards California. You can go south to go to Florida. You can go northeast 95 to go up to Washington, D.C., New York. Or you can go 75 north to head toward Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri. Same with Nashville. It's a its highway system is set up the exact same way. It's, it's essentially just a beltway. And then there's interstates going in every cardinal direction. So both of these cities are hubs especially um, Atlanta because of its access to all the ports and the several airports. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's one smaller airport, which is actually down the street from me, that has very lax customs and security. You can literally fly in whatever you want. And they've been... um, Yeah. So, and it was recently... Uh, turned into an international airport. It had been a private airport for most of the last several decades, but is now uh, considered an international airport. So they had to add customs officials to it, but it is still extremely um, slack. There, mm-hmm. It is not like your normal airport. It is uh, a mile from my house, a mile, a mile from where I work. And I literally watch the private jets fly over my house uh, 24 times a day. All these uh, high-end Lear jets and whatnot. It's, it's, it's concerning knowing that a lot of stuff, as far as people, may be coming and going on, out of this airport. Mm-hmm. Because you can literally pull into the airport, and once you go through the guard gate, you literally drive out to the tarmac, your plane's sitting there, you can pull right up to it and unload whatever you got into the plane and you're out. When you land, you can land, your vehicle pulls right up to your plane, you unload it into whatever you're driving, and then you're out. And now wow. that it's an international airport, customs is supposed to be um, being more diligent but they have a very cool restaurant there that's called Aviation that's like a, a completely glass windows where you can see everything. And I literally will sit there and watch the private jets come up and then their personal, you know, black suburban limousines drive right up to their planes and they'll get right out and drive off. There they go. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's no connecting airport anymore with this airport. It used to be before that you would have to come through a connector and then you would go into what's called McCullum. But now planes will land from Paris or Africa or it's a. Um, yeah. So it, it's interesting. I'm sure there's some politics involved with that as well, but I won't get into that. Yeah. Well, our borders are wide open every which way. So, and that's another Steve Chicolante video where he said, you know what? Um, what comes around goes around. Um, America, well, here's the deal. And, and Rooster brought this up today in our chat um, that we blew up Putin's bridge in in the, the Black Sea. We, we, we blew that thing up along with the Nord Stream pipeline. Yeah. Hmm. There, so now there's... what happens to us? Now what happens to us? Because, you know, we, we've that... been erasing the, the, the borders of other nations and infiltrating their government and taking down regimes we didn't like and replacing them with our own people 
for decades. What's happening to us right now? Yeah, it's uh, karma is long overdue. Um, <laughs> yeah, what and, and happened? Karma, what happened recently? And it's, my, it's the the consequences of our actions. What happened yeah. recently in Moscow that they mm -hmm. said uh, was an an ISIS attack? I have an al alternate theory that I'm not sure if I should share on this platform, but I don't. I think there was a three letter agency. We need to. We need to. That. We need our next thing we need to work on is our uh, subscriber only show where we can talk about these things that aren't safe for YouTube. Yeah, I would like I would like for us to be able to stream on our social network. Uh, well, even just Rumble, we could do it on Rumble and then publish it on the social network. But what about streaming it on our platform where we don't we wouldn't we, have to worry about anybody. We can't afford dude, we can't afford the servers for that. We need to just use Rumble. Hmm. Yeah, you use you use Rumble, and then you just make it a private link that you know only our subscribers can access. We need more uh, partners on our social platform, guys. I know we have a ton of people that have signed up for the paid memberships, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, but there's still yeah. about half of the members on our platform that are doing the free membership, and that's fine. I understand f some folks, they just are not in a position to be able to financially donate. And if that's the case, that's totally fine. Though, if you're able to, it, it would help us out if you're able to, you know, even if it's only $10 a month, it adds up. The servers, the hosting, everything is, it's pretty expensive. Um, yeah, we've, the already, software, we've already... It's, We've already doubled the servers twice, and we're looking. We're already at fifty percent capacity on the servers, so it, we're it's growing very fast. And it, the more that we have to double it, uh, the more expensive it gets. These servers aren't cheap, and it's fine. We anticipated this. I'm just yeah. planting the seed with folks. If you know, if it's in within your means of you know ten or twenty dollars a month, it really helps us because it adds up. We have. Uh, we've only been up a few weeks, and we're we're right at about six or seven hundred users. And there's a lot of daily activity, and it's it's actually really awesome seeing our community there. Yeah. I'm just planting that seed. If you guys are able to, that would help us out. Yeah. So, hey, and don't forget to like and share this. So like and, and share, yep. like and share, and then uh, don't forget Tuesday with with Joel. It is going to be awesome, guys. It's going to be really awesome. So do not miss Tuesday with Joel. He's going to talk about some predictive programming. Religious German shepherds. <laughs> oh, uh, the the guest we had last night sent me some pictures of his German shepherds. Yeah. Oh my Shane. gosh, they are so beautiful. Yeah. If anybody is looking for a German Shepherd dog that's a purebred trained, our guest last night, that's what he does for a living is he trains and breeds um, German import purebred, uh, uh, purebred German Shepherds uh, for security dogs. And he is very passionate about what he does. And boy, let me tell you what, those dogs look beautiful. I grew up with German Shepherds, so it's a, I have a soft spot for them. But yeah. uh, I'm going to post the pictures on our social media platform. You can tell that the temperament of these dogs is absolutely perfect. You can just see it in their disposition and their interactment with him. They look so loving and so sweet, but you can tell by their colors and their body composition that the, the breed is really on point. Yeah, and he's and, got a he's got a litter right now that's available if you're in, in the market, and he's in Texas. So if you're close yeah. to Texas, he's moving out to Tennessee, which is cool. He may come to Kennesaw. Um, nice. He, he, he what's interesting is he's been a Texas Texan man his whole life, and he had swore that he would never leave Texas, but mm. it has gotten so bad in Texas that he's uh, sadly has to admit that. Um, it's lost and it's only a matter of time. And I hate to hear someone say that. Yeah. It's if you guys well, you didn't know, watch. Speaking of predictive programming, you know, this movie civil war that's coming out in April has Four days Texas after. And, uh, 
Yeah, it's four days after the eclipse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it has Texas and California um, aligning in order to separate, and uh, they're they're part of the Civil War. So it's interesting that Texas, which used to stand for freedom, is now uh, being, you know, in the in the you know TV and uh, television programming is being portrayed as, um, you know, separating from the United States again. Well, well that, there's been a lot of talk of that since. Well, since I've been here, that's for sure. <laughs> so. Well, it's all by design, guys. Mm -hmm. it, they they knew that Texas would be a thorn in their side for this doctrine. And when I was talking to Shane, they he was explaining that they are so overran yeah. with they're they're being they're being flooded, and not only that, the federales are putting pressure on the local enforcement to just cut cut and release. Doesn't matter what you do. But if you're a local and you live there and you aim to defend yourself, you'll go to jail. But yeah. if you're on the flip side of the coin, you can essentially get away with murder and they cut you loose. Yikes. And that seems to be the theme going on right now nationally. Um, in New York, it's a very prominent course of action. And you have to really step back and think about what is the reason for this? It is to stop the citizens of this country from defending themselves from these invaders. They are, it's, it's really sad. I don't even know how to put it into words, but there's going to yesterday about, about, um, April 1st, all of the funding for the, the migrants, the immigrants, the refugees, whatever you want to call them, the illegals in um, Arizona is going to run out and they're going to just let those people go. And my guess is um, it's, it's going to be a fight to keep your home. <laughs> yeah. I, that's my guess is, is you're going to be fighting in that area for what is yours. Well, speaking of which, um, I was having a dialogue with someone um, in a private messaging on our social platform, and she um, had the position of, you know, loving thy neighbor and, and kind of in defense of the migrants. And what she said was really touching. Um, I'm trying to see if I can log in. Uh, I got logged out. But I wanted to read it on the air because she had a really heartfelt um, response to this. And I thought it was really uh, well said and well put together. Well, I know that I, I like the thought of we can turn this around on those who, who are planning this. Uh, let's preach the gospel to these people. Let's get them saved. Let's get them on fire so that they'll want to go back to where they came from and and rescue the lost there. But let's get these people saved. Just, hey, as long as you're here, you want to hear about Jesus? Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm pulling up her message because I want her to read it because she had a really, uh, I really enjoyed what she said because it was a totally different perspective on what we're talking about and she made some good points that, you know, it, it, it seems that we have been uh, overly critical. And granted, there's all the reason in the world for it as well. Um, but that still doesn't mean that we don't love our neighbor. Give me one yeah, second. No. I'm looking it up. Yeah, it has nothing to do with loving our neighbor. It's the fact that they're uh, men, primarily 18 to 40, fighting age, um, that we that are coming in illegally. We know nothing about them, so we're just pointing out the uh, the suspicion um, and the fact that it's lining up with uh, a lot of prophetic events. Uh, that's what we're pointing out. It has nothing to do with whether we love them or not. It's just. We know we're in the end times, and Scripture tells us what to expect. 
So, you know, we, we don't bring this up as a means to fear monger or, or, or make people afraid. In fact, this is probably the most exciting time to ever be alive. Uh, and we know that Jesus said these things have to take place. So, uh, you know, they have to take place for a reason. I don't know the specific reason. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't know the specific reason, but it seems to be causing a separation. I mean, look how many people have come to Jesus in just the last three years. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I'll I'll read that and I'll I'll talk about it maybe on the next show just because I want to digest it and so I have yeah. something to comment on. But I, her message was um, simple, in a nutshell. You know, you want to be compassionate and loving to everyone. Oh yeah. You know, but she it was more extensive than that. But um, I want to digest it a little further so I can comment on it just because. I mean, your point, you guys' point is valid. It's, you know, what we have is something intentional that has been set up for nefarious reasons. And unfortunately, some of these people and families that have come in, they're a tool in the administration's game. And it's a, it's a, it's a sad uh, byproduct of what's going on. But at the same time, I know for a fact there is a large percentage of the folks that have come here with malintent, people that left their families behind and had come here on a mission. And that it's hard to be compassionate and loving towards, even though I was to do my very best to do that. It is difficult to wrap your head around their intention. So by any chance, Chris, was it do good? No, it wasn't do good. Okay. Cause do good says the people coming across the border are lost and also need a safe place. Uh, I, I'm fighting to keep this up here. Uh, also need a safe place to, um, the earth in the eyes of the Lord has no borders. Just uh, is there is it, no, it, it Jew may or be do good, but uh, her name on our platform is Annika, so mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that her nickname on uh, YouTube is not is different. I mean, if she's watching the show, um, she can simply put in the chat, "That was me that sent you the message," but mm -hmm. she had a very heartfelt statement. Um, she she has told me that she's a disabled single mom. So if that's you, just let me know. It, and I enjoy getting these messages that open my eyes that allow me to see the flip side of the coin. And she's right. You, you never know the real true story behind the reason why some of the folks are here. They could be fleeing oppression and and genocide from another country. And if that's the case, you know, I pour my heart out to you to help as best as I can. But I know for a fact that there is a large percentage of folks that are here that are intentionally the enemy with mal uh, intent consequences that mean to do us harm. And oh, if yeah. that's the These case, the people, yeah, we were, we are already seeing them. Um, you know, in, in the places where they're being housed, uh, police won't even go near them because the police are getting beaten up and the crime is increasing. So we know that there's, and they have money, you know, they, uh, you know, in a lot of these places, they're being given large sums of money and their crime is still a problem. And I will say this, I, uh, I remain loving and patient just about under most circumstances. But if you endanger my family or my kids, I will go scorched earth on you and you'll see a side that you won't want to see. And when that's, that's, yeah. that's mm -hmm. something I think about when it comes to um, the narrative that's going on. And I don't want to be that person. Yeah, meekness uh, does not mean weakness. No. Doesn't mean you're weak. Yeah. Moses was called the meekest man and he beat the crap out of the Egyptians. Yeah. With the power of God. Yeah, so you know they're going to be in a desperate position here shortly. 
they're going to have the rug pulled from underneath of them. And when people are in desperate position, they do desperate things. Yeah. And um, yeah. I know for a fact, I'm 99.9% sure this was the plan all along. This in acts instability creates chaos because here's the bottom line. All the democratic countries around the globe are dealing with the same thing. And the reason is, is because these democratic countries are not going to vote in the power that needs to be voted in in order for them to usher in the antichrist. They need that, you know, that authoritarian power brought in. Uh, in these democratic countries, they are pushing back against that. You can see it every day because all you have to do is go on social media. Go on Twitter and read our current administration's post and just read the comments on one of his posts. Yeah. He makes a post every day and there'll be thousands of comments. And if you want to laugh, go look at uh, our current administration's uh, Twitter page. Read one of his posts because he posts all the time. And the comments that are in there it really gives you a true concept of the identity of the perspective of the average American. That being said, they know this, they yeah. know this. So their plan for these democratic countries is to cripple them with chaos, to create so much chaos that folks will be ready to just throw in the towel to have any source or any type of normalcy and that's what will usher in the AC. And, hey, and I'll point something out here also. It doesn't say uh, love love everybody as yourself. It says love your neighbor as yourself. Go study who your neighbor is. Jesus is very clear about who your neighbor is. It's not, it's not the people who don't care, who walk away and would do evil and harm unto you. It's the one who would stop and take care of the ones who's injured. It's the ones that... I'll just say it, who's written in the book of life. Those people who, who we know are going to be saved, that's your neighbor. You know how we know that? Because there's 200 million man army that's raised up to fight against Yeshua and the end times. There's there's a coming apocalypse and there's a lot of people that, are, that don't love him that want to fight and die at his hand, you know, as the end result. But mm -hmm. yeah, be very careful about that. You know, don't conflate just because you turn the other cheek or if someone sues you, you know, you give them, you know, two cloaks. Um, that's a mindset. That's a heart to where you don't repay evil with evil. You know, there are people who are suffering who will project their pain onto other people's. You don't repay, you don't repay the pain that the adversary has worked in their life back to them. You love them because we're told to love them. You, you know, they're our neighbors. But if somebody would would intend to do you harm and kill you because of your love for Jesus, that's not your neighbor. Yeah. Yep. Who was his neighbor? The one who helped him, the one who loved him. And actually, in that parable is not a parable. It's a true story. And who who is the man that got beat up? It's us. Yeah. Who are the thieves? It's the demonic realm. It's the fallen angels who are supposed to take care of us and guide us. Um, they're the ones that beat us up and left us for dead. And and it was it was religion and the law that came by and had no love and had no heart and kept walking because it was a Pharisee and a lawyer. So it was the law and religion and they walked right past. But who stopped? Who stopped? The Samaritan. Well, what is a Samaritan? A Samaritan is someone whose mother is Jewish, but their father is something else. Oh, hey, guess whose mother is Jewish, but his father is way something else. Jesus. So it was Jesus. And he's the one that, that picked us up, put his cloak on us, cleaned us up, put the oil of the Holy Spirit on us, and, and took mankind to that kind innkeeper of the Holy Spirit, thank you, to care for us. And he gave him two denarii, two days wages and said, if I owe you anything else, when I come back, I'll pay it. So he was signifying 2000 years and he would be back for yeah. us. Ding dong. That's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. And there. So Jesus is the Samaritan. 
my earpiece just died on me. <laughs> oh. Doesn't mean you guys you got anything can't talk. Going you guys went Turn silent. Dancing queen, while we wait. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was waiting for the music to start. I can, I can well, sing. <laughs> I can dance. Well. But yeah, so just for all of you, um, I know that there's a big eclipse fever, and um, you can go back in our feeds. We do have some eclipse videos where we really just tear the whole thing apart and really, really go through all three of the eclipses, the Revelation 12 sign. Um, if you go back, um, Watchful has his video on the signs of the heavens and, and um, uh, oh gosh, what is it? The, the, um, they're asking about your perspective on Canada and the eclipse. Several people have made a comment in the chat. Um, I'm you know, not sure I have not I dug into Canada. I have not dug into Canada. I know it's very, very close to um, Toronto and Montreal. Um, there's probably a word for Mr. Justin Trudeau in there. Um, I, I believe his days are numbered. I really do. But I have not really looked that up, honestly. Sorry, guys. I have not looked into Canada. Although I did read the other day, um, I want to say it was the Epoch Times, the Epic Times, whatever that's called. Um, they were doing a story on the northern border um, and how dangerous it is becoming. And how people who own land up in that area, who have farms, they're finding all manner of stuff on their land. They're they're finding people just walking through, um, of all nationalities, all nationalities. Hey, Crazy. Watch, watchful. What did you call the type of person that overcomplicates the um, the the doctrine of Christ. Um, you, it, you, McCall was a good example, but you had a specific word that it's been on the edge of my tongue all night that I can't remember. Um, I don't remember. Oh. A Pharisee? <laughs> no, no, there's, he, he had, he had a specific name for the type of people that cast stumbling blocks in front of folks that are trying to understand the core concept of Christ and really, you know, just get very political with their doctrine. Um, yeah, you had a name for it, and it was perfect, but now I can't remember. Yeah. Anyways. Well, it's no. unfortunate when, when people have to flex their muscle on how much they know. And in they, they're trying to teach, they're trying to reach, but, but there's a pride in that. And the bummer is that, that they think they're helping somebody, they think they're touching them. Um, teaching somebody but really that person has no idea what they're talking about because yeah, no it's love. not it's not religious rottweiler that's that's you know <laughs> i know that's a good term but uh, watchful had a really good name for it i'm surprised he hasn't shouted it out yet because he said it to me many times i'm um, curious now too i want to know <laughs> well what's, what's you, my you, word well you had a name uh, for mccall on his behavior you had a label for that type of behavior Someone that in, injects the doctrine through no humility. And mm. the, the bottom line is this, guys. You can't overcomplicate this process. I see so many people often in the chat that will confuse the living daylights out of some of the folks with their, their jargon and their technicality. Just know that you're casting stumbling blocks in people's paths. That's not a good thing. I promise yeah. you. And you don't want to be in that position. You don't want to have to answer to him why you are doing that. It's a very yeah, simple concept, guys. Just have a personal relationship with him. Period. End of story. Everything else happens naturally. If you have that daily intimate relationship with him, that's it. Your beliefs will fall into place. You'll know that he died on the cross for all mankind, you know, and rose three days later and sits at the right hand of God. All that stuff comes naturally through that, that intimate relationship with him. Everything else that you're concerned about and what you need to learn and what you got to do and how you got to read it, all of that, it's all in your personal relationship. That's where it starts. 
So for folks that are concerned about all the technicalities, do not listen to people like that. They are casting stumbling blocks in your path. Focus on that personal relationship with Christ. That's it. A lot of people are like that because of uh, the environments. You know, there's something called protection to where when people are abused, they tend to abuse others in the same way that they, in the same way that they've been abused. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're, if you're in that kind of a church to where they force you to believe things and you can't question what they're telling you and you're, you're doing that same thing to others, uh, that should be a red flag. Uh, that is typical. That is typical of a church that has, um, that itself gets abused, it gets attacked by the adversary a lot and they become very legalistic and, uh, you know, yeah, that was the word I was looking for legalistic yeah 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 yeah. they become very legalistic and jesus says to return to your first love which is loving your neighbor uh you know and those are the attributes that we see that he loves is those who love god and love their neighbor love those who love other people frank it's not that i don't want you to say anything just apply a little bit of common sense to reading the room it's not that we don't want you to share the gospel Of course we do, but a good amount of folks are maybe not operating on the same wavelength with you. And when you explain things in a legalistic manner, it confuses folks. And when you confuse folks, you create doubt. And when you create doubt, it casts stumbling blocks. And that's something that gets me fired up because I work very diligently to make sure the community is being guided the right way. And it's not something I'll tolerate. I'll just tell you that right now. And if you get butt hurt over it, then it is what it is. But we love our community and we're not going to throw stumbling blocks in front of them. So you don't have to take your ball and go home. Just say you're not going to talk at all. That sounds like something my 13 year old would say. Yeah. Just think about what you have to say before you say it. Is it going to bring someone closer to Christ or is it not? It, can they misunderstand what you're saying? Can they misinterpret it? Can it confuse them? Then if the answer is yes, then maybe simplify your message, which is why I say the same thing every night. I don't legalize it or overcomplicate it because people can interpret that the wrong way. This is why so many churches have turned people away from Christ because they make this elaborate you know, path that is impossible for just about anyone to fulfill. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Yeah, And it fires me up. All the things I've learned through my years. So uh, I've, I've followed the lamb my entire life and I've been through a lot of different churches and the, the, probably the single greatest epiphany that I had is it, it matters less about being right and wrong and so much more about love. Uh, you can be dead right about something, and if you're not doing it out of love, you're dead wrong. Yeah, it's just that simple. You're so a clanging gong. So, don't, <clears throat> yeah, don't fight so so hard to prove to somebody that you're right and they're wrong, especially if you're not if you're doing it in an unloving manner. Now we can have debates. We can talk all day long about you know interpretation and what things mean and you know where we are in the timeline. But at the end of the day, we should still love each other because we're, you know, in the same body of Christ. You know, it's 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 not like you're sitting there, you know, when you're when you're fighting to be right, it's like you're sitting there punching yourself in the face. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah. And Frank, you know, you know your scripture, and you even said that, you know, God has called you to teach. So go teach. Dude, go teach. You if you've got a church, go teach Sunday school. Have a Bible study. Get your own channel. Teach, man, teach. So I don't know what you can teach in the chat that's going so fast and you only have a few words. Um, A lot of times that gets misconstrued and a lot of times it kind of sounds like you're poking at people. And and I'll tell you, if you're called to teach, man, go do it. The time is short. Dude, if you don't do it, someone else will rise up and take your place. And I guarantee you, they won't do the job you will. Yeah. Well, I mean, really the bottom line is You know, it's all about love and compassion. You know, everything points at love. And once you take love out of the equation, 
then it takes a whole different perspective. And, you know, Christ is very clear. God is love. Yeah. It's not prideful. It doesn't boast. You can go right down the list. So you have to keep it simple. Our, yeah. our main goal is helping folks get that personal relationship with Christ. They have that covenant with him. That's it. Because everything else naturally falls into place once you have that. I know I'm a broken record, but it's, 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 it's that simple, guys. It really is that simple. So many people question their position of faith and if they're saved and this and that. And I, I understand your concern. And the, the doubt that is put in your mind, that is from the enemy. Because don't think you're the only one. That happens to everybody, not just you. But what you can give you that solidified confidence is having that daily relationship with him. And I promise you, if you, you do that and you make it a habit to include him throughout your day with everything that you do, you will see a difference. And I know for some folks that it may sound like that is an impossible task. It really is not. I've been on the other side and thought about that perspective being something that's not obtainable. It is. You just have to allow him to come in and influence you. And once that influence and that spirit and, you know, comes in and takes over, everything else will naturally happen. Your body will, will yearn for that information. You will be drawn to it. It's difficult to put into words, so that's why I try to simplify it as best I can because it, it really is that simple because once you open that door and allow him to come through and then you shut the door behind him, it's a whole different ball game, and things will change, and they'll change for the better. So that's yeah. why I get so bent out of shape when there's folks overcomplicating the process. <laughs> and don't, don't try to win arguments and texts there's the, in, the lack of intonation and uh, identifying how people are actually saying things. Me and Chris, yeah. this happens constantly because I am so blatant and brunt with the way that I speak. Often Christopher thinks I'm pissed or I'm mad or I'm going to quit or something like that because I'll say, like, I'm not going to do something. You know, you know, if this X, Y, Z happens, I ain't going to do something. And because he can't understand, there's no tone or intonation. He he, he takes it to mean one, uh, you know, something entirely different. Uh, so chat text is not a good medium for, for debates. Um, you have to be very careful with how you debate via, via texts, uh, yeah, you know, start yeah. a YouTube channel and invite people on and have conversations. It's entirely possible that you're the most loving person in the world. It's just your words and texts sound harsh. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the chat room is not for, correction and you know passing along your doctrine or your position it's for us to interact together and enjoy ourselves as a community every night there's a different opportunity to learn and frank i would encourage you and and other folks that engage in the chat like this to take that opportunity to learn from it and that's what the chat is for. So you guys can interact together on the topic, not hold a completely different conversation off topic of what's going on on the show. And yeah. if you do, that's fine. It's, you know, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I love having the community here and you guys chatting and enjoying yourselves. But I don't like to see the religious Rottweilers in the chat spewing doctrine and creating division. It's just not a good environment. It, the environment should be about love and compassion and how we can love and learn together. So yeah. that's really just my core concept. Amen. All right. Well, this was fun. Fun night. Yeah. Tomorrow's Sabbath. It's, is it a Easter weekend coming up? Yeah, we it is. Easter? Oh, so... Um, are you guys going to have shows on, on Saturday and Sunday night? Um, uh, probably. 
I know that. I know um, Dr. Thrapp was asking if he could come on Saturday night. I hadn't answered him yet because I didn't know watchful schedule. I'm checking it now. As far as uh, Sunday night, I don't see a problem with that unless watchful has plans. If my wife is listening, you didn't put anything on the calendar, so I'm assuming front Saturday is free. <laughs> so it looks like we're good. That's how that goes, right? <laughs> She's always telling me, she says, I put it on the calendar. You should know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I usually have my granddaughter on, on Saturday nights, but I don't know this week. There's, there's a few other things at play, so I don't know what I'll do if I don't have my baby. Probably join you guys because <laughs> she does not let me do anything but play with her. All right. Well, guys, we really enjoy the time with you. Um, I'll provide an update on our social platform if we're going to be on Saturday night. I'm pretty sure that we are. I think Dr. Thrapp, Dr. Thrapp is going to come address that issue. Um, the talking point of the wheats and the tares that I mentioned the other day. And he has a very good talking point and a way to clarify that. And he, he's someone that I respect his opinion and his perspective. So um, I'm excited to have him explain to me and to explain to you guys really the reality of the rapture doctrine and if there is consequences for spreading something of that nature or if there is not. So, it, it'll be interesting. It, he is, you know, he is not a religious Rottweiler. He is all about love and compassion. So he had to correct me on that perspective about risking your salvation based off of um, spreading or, you know, talking about the rapture. It's so yeah. I'm un, I'm kind of unclear yet on what the actual reality of it is. So I'm going to have him come explain it because there's so many there's so many ways to in interpret the scripture and trying to understand that position. And, you know, I could have, I could be totally wrong about what I said, but you know, it's, think of it, think of it this way. If you're going to be held accountable for everything you speak, say, or do um, adjust how you say things, because you can say something in a way that expresses what you believe and still allows for you to be wrong. So, you know, don't be so quick to tell, you know, to teach something as though it is fact, uh, if it if, if it's simply your understanding, because a lot of people have different opinions and different experiences, um, you know, always allow for the possibility that you can be wrong. Yeah. Because uh, if you're going to be held accountable for something you teach and you happen to be wrong about it, um, you know, you, you always have this like you hear me say things like it seems like or it sounds like uh, because that allows for the possibility to where, well, if it seems like this means this or it sounds like you're saying that um, you always have that out to where it's like, well, I, it just seemed that way to me at the time. Um, it's a it's a very good technique for being empathetic with people, too, uh, rather than telling somebody that they're wrong. You can say, well, it sounds like you have a misunderstanding or it seems like you, you understand it this way. But, you know, my understanding is X, Y, Z. So um, I always think about that because I'm, I'm co always conscious. I try to. I've, 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 been a, I've, I've been a religious Rottweiler in the past and so convinced about things that um, I will probably be held accountable for the things that I've said. And I'll be, I'm sure there will be a lot of apologizing in the, uh, at, at the Day of Judgment. Uh, but, yeah. But when it comes to, like, as far as, like, losing your salvation, I that is a bigger that is a bigger subject. Bigger, yeah, bigger I, talk. Yeah, I thought it was an important one to clarify because there was some folks highly in support of it, and some folks that were concerned about it. And when I initially brought it up, I I explained that this was a perspective that I was considering. That um, it, the bottom line is whatever the teaching is from whomever it is, take it to the Holy Spirit yourself. Yeah. Take it as data entry, take it as information so that you can learn and then take it to the scripture and then pray about it and allow God to simply 
clarify it. it. It's, you know, I just bring up points and information that I feel like is valuable for folks to know. But in the end, it just as I tell everybody, it's, it's something that it appears to be a certain way or it's my perspective. There's nothing 100% concrete that I say other than what Christ's position is. You know, that's the only thing I'm ever confident on is that relationship with Christ. Everything else, I remain humble because I could be wrong on a perspective or, you know, a teaching. And I'm openly willing to, to hear the correction and learn from my mistakes. So that's the point of having Dr. Thrap on in, in the coming days, just because I would like to, you know, I, I'm always learning as well. And that's really yeah. the kind of the key to life. We're always learning. We're always learning. You have to one remain of the humble. Biggest, one of the biggest challenges when you're convinced about something is considering the possibility that you might be wrong. Um, you know, talking about it, it's, it's something that's easy to say. But when you're in that situation that you're absolutely 100% convinced about something, um, that, that's, the, that's the point in time when you should be most careful and make sure that you're allowing for the possibility that you might be wrong. Because that's where ego and pride creep in and get you. Yeah. And it's God has a way of humbling folks that have issues with pride. Pride is one of those what they call a, a deadly sin. And the reason it's considered deadly is because it's so dangerous. And you either are prideful or you're humble. It's mm -hmm. not both. And, you know, I'm, I, I, there was a point in my life where I was very prideful. I was not humble. And I was humbled several times. Humility is truly the key to many, many things in life. Yeah. And especially when it comes to Christ and having that personal relationship with him, you have to remain humble. If you don't, God is notorious for humbling the prideful. So just take that as a piece of advice from someone that has been humbled by our Lord for being prideful. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, it was fun. You guys have anything else you want to say before I cut it loose? Nope. Yeah. I'm all done. And um, the truth in the chat, he said that was Satan's sin, pride. Absolutely. That is what got him cast. He was, from my understanding, the most, the most intelligent, the, the highest intelligence, the most cunning out of all of uh, God's creations. He was, he was next level. And that intelligence and that ability went straight to his head. Enough so where he took a third of the angels with him. So, well, it's lot. funny because the scripture says that until iniquity was found in him, iniquity. What's that? Well, there's there's a couple of different ways to look at iniquity. One of them is a lack of love. Iniquity was found in him. He had no love. Yeah. Pride. Pride is a lack of love for anybody else. Yeah. yeah. Wickedness. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, everybody have a wonderful night. It was great being with everybody again. We'll most likely see you Saturday night. I'll put an update in the social media. If you guys haven't joined on our social platform, make sure you do. We really enjoy the community there. It is really booming. And it's uh, the just tons of awesome information coming through there. And the the love and humbleness there is just, it's, it's fun. You don't see uh, a lot of the tox toxicity that you see on these other social platforms. You know, I can go on Twitter and I usually can only take about three minutes of it before I, I get off of it because there may be, be one or two very interesting posts, but then there'll just be a battery of negativity and toxicity. And I'm just not interested in that stuff. You know, it's... <laughs> It's, um, I'm not interested in that stuff. So it's been very relieving to have a community on a social platform where everybody has the same common objective and perspective on life. So, okay, guys, have a great night. Oh, and wait, before we go, 
Um, we're probably going to turn off the Google sign-on on the social network because it's not working properly. We're getting a lot of people getting errors, and we're, we're, I can't trace where the errors are coming from. Uh, they're not showing up in the log. I can only assume that it's from Google itself because they've made some big changes in their code recently. So we're going to turn that off. Um, you, you'll still be able to log in, but you need to reset your password. So if you haven't got, if you come to the website uh, and don't know how to get in, just put in the same email that you use with Google um, and do a forgot password and reset your password. Um, if, if you go to the website while we have it turned on, you can go in and set a password for your account so that when you turn it off, you can just put in your password. So that is coming because we're getting a lot of login errors. We're going to turn that off until Google fixes their stuff. Yeah. And it, everybody pretty much knows how to get in touch with me. Uh, they either can message me on one of the platforms or they have my direct email. If you want me to just help you out with your password set, just send me a message. But in your profile, while you're logged in, you can simply go and change your password. And the reason we're telling you to do this is right now when you log in with Google, you don't actually have to put in a password. You're logged in through Google. But when we turn off that login through Google um, ability, you're actually going to have to key in your username and your password. And if you're logged in with Google right now, that means you don't have a password set. So just go into yeah. your profile and just set your password. If it's confusing, just message me and I'll handle it for you. I can do it on the back end so you guys don't have to stress about it. But everybody have a great night. And uh, we'll probably see you Saturday night. Good night. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>